you by the Creation Academy, an apologetics learning experience designed to teach, train, and inspire others to become strong defenders of the creation account presented in the Bible. Primarily, the Academy offers video and audio courses with downloadable PDF workbooks taught by a team of experienced creation researchers. But members of our exclusive Creation All Access program will also have access to expert interviews and Q&A sessions with creation scientists and apologists, all inside a private Facebook group where you'll fellowship and interact with a like-minded community of believers. We're excited to announce that enrollment is now open. The Academy does not officially launch until March 2019, but until then, you can get into Creation All Access for just $7 per month while we're adding new course material. Join today by going to www.creationcourses.com and clicking on Enroll Now. All right, thanks for tuning in this week. You're listening to the Steve Schram Show. We're training up Christians to become confident and passionate servants of Jesus so they can grow in their walk with God and share their faith more persuasively. That is what we want to help you do. And of course, to do that, we give you some helpful tools, some helpful advice and techniques that you can use when you are sharing your faith with others. Over the past few weeks, we've been discussing something called polemical theology. Polemical theology. And this is a literary kind of lens through which we can look at and understand the Hebrew Bible, or what many know as the Old Testament. And what we have found is that polemical theology has to do with the use of ancient Near Eastern thoughts, uh, motifs, and ideas utilized by Yahweh and the biblical authors to, in a way, satirize or to taunt the false religionists and the false gods of the ancient Near Eastern cultures which surround Israel. And so that is, in a nutshell, what polemical theology is. And we're not going to rehash what we talked about over the past few weeks. You can go back to Lessons 76 and 77 to get those. In those, we talked about the correct use of polemical theology and also some possible misuse of polemical theology. So today, we're going to dive right in and close out this series talking about what I believe is the warranted extent of polemical theology. The warranted extent, and then we're going to give you some takeaways from the entire series. Now, don't forget to go ahead and download this week's lesson handout. It's the same lesson handout that we had for the past few weeks, uh, or the past two weeks, and it's the number one textual reason to think that Jesus thought Genesis was history the number one textual reason to think that Jesus thought that Genesis was history. So it's a good download. To get that, all you got to do is go to steveshram.com slash 076 download. This is lesson 78, but again, it's the same one. So just go to 076 download and you can get that. So let's go ahead and dive right into this week's final lesson on polemical theology. So the first thing I want to mention is this idea of mythic narrative versus historical narrative. Mythic narrative versus historical narrative. Now, this is a distinction made by Currid in the book. And we want to ask two kinds of questions about this. First of all, what is the intent of the literature? And then secondly, what is the genre of the literature? The intent of the literature and the genre of the literature. So regarding the intent, 
while Genesis 1 and 2 are written, again, according to Currid, in Hebrew historical narrative, all A&E creation myths are written in what he calls mythic narrative. That is, they have a linear forward movement, but they're purely a historical, and they deal chiefly with the primordial realm of the gods. So, while there are certainly some similarities that cannot be dismissed, nor can they be denied, the differences are really so striking and profound that they can't be explained just by a simple Hebrew cleansing of particular myths. And, you know, this is something that could probably be most easily seen if you were comparing a couple of these things side by side. It would become quite obvious just looking at them uh, side by side next to each other what the intent of one of them was versus the other. Almost without question, it appears, prima facie anyway, that the intent of Genesis is to communicate accurate historical information. I was browsing Facebook last night, and somebody had asked a question in one of the apologetics-type groups I follow about using the Big Bang as an apologetics tool, even if you are someone who subscribes to young age creationism. And I didn't comment on it. Uh, I, you know, I've, I've mentioned that before here on the podcast. I have kind of similar thoughts. I think that even though I'm a young age creationist and I disagree with the Big Bang and I, I disagree with evolution, I have arguments in my back pocket that point to God from those things. In other words, I'm most interested in getting someone into a relationship with Christ, and I will let him work out issues with their theology, okay, or their understanding of the natural world. Would I love for everybody to see the Bible the way that I do? Well, sure, because then I could be more assured that I was right, but that's simply not the reality. And so I saw this. And, you know, I kept seeing all these comments. Well, I'm not a YEC anymore, you know, young earth creationist. That's what online they typically abbreviate as a YEC. I'm not a YEC anymore, but I'm not a YEC anymore, but when I was, I would use the Big Bang, et cetera, et cetera. And I saw that probably five or six times in the responses. And relative to when I was looking at the post, it hadn't been posted much before that. And... Again, this is just another one of those confirmations that at first blush, when you first look at the text of Genesis, it seems obviously to be teaching this idea of maybe a young age, but certainly of a historical account. And so, of course, there are arguments that have been developed for different understandings on a deeper look, and there are arguments that have been developed indeed for the Prima Fossi understanding into a deeper look. And of course, I still hold that view. But the point I want to make is that it seems obvious just to look at it that Genesis means to communicate historical information. Let me give you this quote by Currid. He says, The style of writing of the cosmogonical texts from the ancient Near East is best described as mythic narrative. What I mean by that term is simply that these creation accounts are legendary stories without determinable basis in fact or history. They're symbolic tales of primordial times that deal principally with the realm of the gods. Their narrative only in the sense that the stories have a linear forward movement, but they're simply ahistorical. Their purpose is to explain the order and meaning of the universe as it stands. Genesis 1 and 2, in contrast, bears all the markings of Hebrew historical narrative. Close quote. So you see what he's arguing. He's arguing that the intent of 
Genesis is to teach accurate history. Now, he's not arguing that that history is correct necessarily. What he's arguing in here is that it is the intent of Genesis to teach accurate history in contrast to the intent of the mythic narratives, which were written in such a way that they are not obviously historical. Of course, this brings us to the reasons why. Now we have to ask another question. This is based, the historicity in this case, on the genre of the literature. Of the genre of the literature. Now, just to correct something that is often misunderstood, especially in young age creationist camps, accurate history can be portrayed even if the genre of the literature is not narrative. Now, it is a lot harder, in my understanding, to know when that is the case. It certainly does seem that if something is written in historical narrative, then we have an easier time and maybe even better justification for saying that accurate history is meant to be recorded. So that is certainly true. But let's not fall into the idea that un uh, excuse me that, that literature that is not written as, as narrative is a historical necessarily because that's not true. Okay. So so the issue of genre and historicity are related, but one does not directly depend on the other. Now, all of that said, I mentioned in that last quote of Currid's that uh, he considers, much like many other Hebrew scholars do, and Old Testament scholars, that Genesis 1 and 2 are indeed written in Hebrew historical narrative. And so here's one of the challenges. You can't define the genre of a biblical text, uh, of a Hebrew text, based upon the genre of an extra-biblical text. Let me say that again. So you can't define the genre of a Hebrew text based on the genre of an extra-biblical text. In fact, in the book, Kurid, he cites uh, the Hoffmeyer, but he says that unless there is good evidence to think that the text were indeed commensurate, you can't determine the genre of one based on another. So a text that is presented as historical narrative in Hebrew, which is is highly lacking in folkloric and mythic kinds of details, should be understood as historical. And again, that's just assessing information, much like we talked about. You know, we have to assess information about the Hebrews based on their worldview. There are things that the Hebrews' worldview does not entail that are entailed by the mythic worldviews which surrounded them. And so while there was no doubt pagan worship and everything happening within the Hebrew culture, And so some of that worldview was certainly muddled in their practice. We've got no reason to think, especially as staunchly monotheistic as the biblical writers are, we have no reason to think that there's anything in the scriptures which are an outgrowth of those faulty worldviews. We just don't have any reason to think that. It's too separate. So the same thing is happening here with the genre question. If we have something that indeed looks like Hebrew historical narrative, now again, I'm not arguing for that here necessarily because we don't have time. That's a different podcast. I'm just saying that in Currid's estimation, as the writer of this book, he does believe that the Hebrews were writing in Hebrew historical narrative. They they wrote in narrative form, and he's convinced that We should understand the details as historical, but this is not the case with the mythic literature that pervaded the cultural 
the, the, the cultures, excuse me, that were surrounding Israel. So one does not entail the other, in other words. Okay, so let's look then at the next thing, which is some of the similarities versus the differences. There are, of course, says Currid, many more distinctions that could be cited between Genesis 1 and 2 and the other ancient Near Eastern creation accounts. But the key point is this. The differences are so monumental and are so striking that they cannot be explained by a simple Hebrew cleansing of myth. We talked about that a little bit earlier and last week. Again, I want to encourage you to read John Oswalt's The Bible Among the Myths. The Bible Among the Myths. And if you read this book and Dr. Currit's book, what you're going to find is that these differences so far outweigh the similarities that it seems almost disingenuous to say that the biblical text relies in some measure on some of these other texts. Now, one of the considerations about that is the question of dating. Dating methods and the authorship of the Pentateuch, these are things that are hotly, hotly debated even today, in ancient Near Eastern and Old Testament scholarship. There is evidence, people present evidence, on both sides of the coin. In other words, there are some who present evidence and say that everything points to some sort of post-exilic authorship. In other words, the Pentateuch and all of these writings came after the period of exile. Some take that so far as to say that there was no such being as Moses. And uh, some do take Mosaic authorship and, uh, and kind of the Mosaic dating and would say that uh, God directly dictated to Moses what things he needed to know. And then there are some who would come in and they would say that there was information passed down, whether orally or in some form of writing, that Moses received and then incorporated into Scripture. Now, obviously, I don't, I don't take the, f- the first view uh, that we talked about. I, I obviously believe there was a real Moses, okay, I believe it's important that there was a real Moses because Jesus affirmed that there was a real Moses. Okay. And so I find it interesting um, that, that people would say that. But that's, again, that's a different discussion. Now, with respect to the other two views, that requires a little bit more thought and fleshing out. And to be honest with you, I'm still working on my own opinion of that. Here, here's the deal. If you take strict Mosaic authorship and you're looking at whether God directly dictated all of the details of the Pentateuch, especially of the first well of Genesis, uh, of course, we realize that Moses was there uh, during the happenings of the Exodus. But so if, if you think about all of the history found in the book of Genesis, we have to wonder whether this was directly dictated by God or whether Moses received some information from sources prior to that. And, of course, God maybe filled in the details, etc., etc. So, again, I still have a lot of study of my own to do on this. So I, I'm getting ready to give you what I think is probably the case, but it's... Not the gospel, okay? Uh, it, it's just, it's my thoughts on this up to this point, and I still have a lot more work to do on it. So don't hold my feet to the flame here, but I do want you to think about it. It seems to me that the preservation of history and the use of oral tradition was, was quite a big deal to the ancient Hebrews,
and I don't have any reason to to think that this sort of thing started with Moses. In other words, I don't have any reason to think that the first person to say, okay, we should really care about what happened in terms of history was Moses. We have no idea. And again, this is there's speculation involved here, but I think it's warranted speculation. We have no idea exactly what things the relationship that, say, Adam shared with God entailed. Or the relationship that Enoch or Noah or Abraham shared with God. But we do know some things. We do know, for example, that Adam was God's ultimate creation. Okay, but, you know, using loose terms, we realize that the apex of God's creation was man, made in the image of God. So we realized that there was, for a time, perfect fellowship and community between God and Adam. The text takes special care to mention that Enoch walked with God. The text takes special care to mention that Noah was a man who uh, was counted to be righteous. Noah was considered a righteous man, not a perfect man but a righteous man whom to whom God showed his good grace to. We know that Adam, or excuse me, not Adam, but Abram, and then, of course, Abraham, we realize that there was certainly a special relationship there of blessing. And I think I don't have exactly where I could point you to, but we certainly have information in Genesis with God communicating to Abraham that it is important to think about future generations and the preservation and the knowledge of the things of the world. And then uh, even later in Genesis, of course, we see things moving towards the direction of Joseph. And there's there's not a bad thing said about Joseph. It constantly the text is reaffirming us that the Lord was with Joseph. And so here is what I'm getting at. And especially if you consider that in what some would call the, you know, primordial history, which I don't like to use that language, but if you look at Genesis 1 through 11, basically, in those chapters, you have mankind living for much longer than after the flood. And again, there's reasons for that. We've talked about that other times. But if you take all of these things into consideration in the communication and things of that nature, and then you also consider events like the Tower of Babel, where uh, depending on your view of that, most, if not all, of the population of the world was in a, a fairly central location and opportunities abounded for distortions and myths and things like that to spread. And indeed, we see all of these different cultures arising from out of that scene, cultures that the Hebrews are said to borrow from, for example, like the Canaanites, etc. When we look at this, we find in the biblical story reason to think that Moses was at the end of the line, of a long line, of oral tradition. Of course, the oral tradition continued, but but until God filled in the gaps, so to speak, we've got every reason to think that Noah, or, or, or excuse me, that Moses had information that was passed down through the centuries about the true nature of reality and the true history of the world. And yes, Moses was trained up and learned in the ways of the Egyptians. That is absolutely true. But he was also raised in his childhood by his Hebrew mother. Now, I realize that the question is not what could God have done or what could have been the case, but what actually happened. And a lot of these dating methods, and again, this is the issue, if 
there was no oral tradition being passed down. And if the dating methods are giving us accurate information, then Moses wrote his accounts after some of these other mythical accounts were written. And so this is where that dependence, that authorship dependence kind of idea comes in. Now, to be sure, there are some who take the view that Moses was writing the true history, even though it was being dictated him directly from God, which I think is totally possible, and that he didn't receive it from any kind of oral information. And so it just simply means that these other distortions were written down before the true account. So that view is possible too. However, given the other just internal evidence that I suggest that, and I didn't even give specific verses and things like that, but, uh, and that could, that could be done, I'm sure. Uh, and as I study into this more, maybe I'll get there. Okay. I think that, no, I'm not going to say, uh, okay. So there is good reason, I think, internally to think that these things were passed down. And that causes me to question strongly. Even the uh, foundation in principle for the view that Moses was simply copying and cleansing these myths. So again, we're talking about the similarities and the differences between some of these myths. And what Kurt has pointed out is that Genesis is so different. And again, what Oswald points out in his book is that Genesis is so different. Exodus is so different. The biblical revelation in general is so different that the similarities are minute in comparison. And to, so, so to form a theology based on the sparse similarities without a hefty consideration of the differences would be to do the text of the Hebrew Bible, an injustice. Now, there are, of course, some parallels that are not easily explained by polemical theology, and they're outside of the scope for our discussion today. Uh, But Curran says, for example, uh, polemical uh, theology certainly does not answer every question about the relationship of the Old Testament to ancient Near Eastern literature and life. There is much to that relationship that simply cannot be understood and explained by the use of polemics. At times, however, polemical theology can serve as a solid and reliable interpretive lens by which one can properly see the significance of a parallel, close quote. And I think he's right about that. But notice, whatever these other things are that Currit has in mind, he obviously doesn't think that they are substantial enough to overthrow the idea that we should take Israel's view on its own terms, Israel's writing on its own terms, and not allow the mythic writing that was based on polytheistic worldviews to influence how we understand the intent and the genre of the literature of the Bible. All right, let me give you as a conclusion, three takeaways that I got from this book. And again, uh, a lot of my notes that I've been giving you here, actually all of them, come directly out of my own uh, note-taking process that I use with books. Uh, Anytime I read a book, I go in and I use this process to retain information about it. And I'm happy to talk to you about that sometime. But when I do that, I always identify three key takeaways from the book. So, uh, you know, a year from now, I can go back and I can look at important quotes. I can look at important thoughts that I gleaned. And I can also look at the, the key takeaways that I wanted to remember after reading this book. And so I'm going to give those to you now for this book before we wrap up for today. Okay, takeaway number one, the mere presentation of the Hebrew literature in question as historical narrative suggests that many a and parallels can be understood as a polemic. There is no need to fear when these instances arise. Rather, they must be studied to understand the proper relationship. In other words, all I'm trying to communicate here is that this, this fear 
of what, <laughs> uh, what, what Kerr refers to in the book as a crass plagiarism, okay, this fear that we are looking at an untrue, possibly even a historical revelation of the Hebrew writers, uh, it, it dissipates when we understand properly the use of the writers of polemical theology. Okay, the second takeaway is that nearly everything A&E cultures believed about reality stemmed from their polytheistic worldview. Thus, the Hebraic understanding of a transcendent, imminent, personal creator creates a completely different reality for Israel. What other cultures merely invented in the imagination was factual history for Israel. And again, you will see that as you read through the book, you will see these things that uh, appeared in Hebrew literature again, a court, or excuse me, in in A and E literature other than the Hebrews, uh, like Egyptian literature. By the dating methods, they appeared well before the writing of the Hebrews. However, it appears that in these cases, the way that they are written in Hebrew versus the way that they are written with these other cultures seems to suggest that that these instances were God using a sense of satire to indeed show that what the mythical writers imagined, God could actually make happen right before their eyes, and Moses recorded it as such. And then the third and final takeaway is that one can fully trust in the accuracy and reliability of the record as presented in the Hebrew Bible. It would appear that the borrowing of ideas goes both ways when cultures collide. Thus, what was fact for Israel often became myth for her neighbors, and what was myth for her neighbors became fact for Israel. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we love you. Thank you so much for your goodness and mercy and grace to us. Thank you for allowing us to study this idea of polemical theology. I pray now, Lord, that if my listeners have not gotten this book, Lord, you'd make a way available for them to grab that and spend some time reading it so they can understand this beautiful way that you have allowed us to learn more about your revelation. Thank you, God, for everything you do in our lives. Thank you, Lord, not only that we can understand deep theology, but that you're a personal, imminent creator who loves us and cares about even the smallest details of our lives, Lord. Thank you again for everything. We love you, and in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, well, I do want to thank you for joining me this week for part three of a primer on polemical theology. We are now finished up with this study, so we're going to be moving on to something different next week. Got a couple really exciting interviews coming up for you. I don't know exactly what dates those will air, but uh, it's really going to be fun. I'm excited about these interviews. We got some great guests coming on in, in coming days, so be looking forward to those. Please don't forget to go and download the free lesson handout for this lesson. It's the number one textual reason to think that Jesus thought Genesis was history. And you can get that again by going to steveschram.com slash 076 download. This is lesson 78, but again, lesson 76, 77, and 78 all have the same handout. It's the number one textual reason to think that Jesus thought Genesis was history. You can get it at steveschram.com slash 076 download. Okay, I hope you have a great week. Love you. We'll see you here next time on the show. Bye-bye.